Bueno, pues eh, tiene la palabra Viola Safik, que como decía, ha escrito numerosos libros, eh, también es realizadora de cine, ha hecho sus propias películas, es una persona imprescindible también en el panorama de, de festivales, eh, en los jurados de festivales internacionales de cine, y nos va a, a, a llevar de viaje por el Nilo eh, desde eh, Hollywood al, al cine árabe. Uh, sorry, thank you so much, no, Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very touched by this invitation. I, I cannot almost tell you how much because, uh, I mean, I didn't expect, you know, to be, uh, also when you invited me, I didn't expect that it's, uh, you know, you told me it's, it's for Professor uh, Alberto Elena, but I wasn't, you know, kind of aware of the, you know, how much, I mean, that this is really a tribute. So, I, you know, I feel... I, I don't deserve it because, you know, I mean, there are so many other people who also worked hard to, uh, to you know, uh, on on all the, the cinemas that, uh, all the different cinemas that uh, Alberto Elena was also um, knowledgeable about. So, yeah, it, I feel even more honored. And actually, um, maybe even more because uh, I met him only one time in my life. Uh, that was uh, when I was in, when, when he actually was behind inviting me to the, uh, to the um, um, uh, jury of the Festival del Sur. Um, and this was the only occasion when, I, when we ever met. Otherwise, we had only email exchanges lar largely about uh, um, that he was in trying to invite me to work uh, to to you know to contribute something to one of uh, of the numerous publications he had um so yeah and he was otherwise very generous also in giving advice and and helping out um whenever i also had a question so i'm really very grateful and thank yeah thank you for inviting me um yeah, and I apologize also because I was also in the Cartage Film Festival, so I took the only possible flight in Connecticut. I had a t round table yesterday, so I took the flight very early today, and somehow I feel not really, I'm not on top of my energy. So uh, I should have done some yoga, but I didn't, <laughs> so it's not good. Anyways, so you will forgive me if I have some lapses or, you know, it takes a little bit time uh, to formulate, so you will be generous enough with me, I hope. Okay, so, um, it's very nice to uh, have you uh, heard speaking about, uh, you know, um, uh, Professor Elena's interest in peripheries, because I think um, maybe this is something I wasn't really aware of that we actually share. Uh, because um, I always, even even if I work on film industries like the Egyptian one, I always also look at the periphery. And I actually one of my interests is to see uh, the inter the kind of interaction between periphery and center, what happens there, and how 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 you know does that happen? Um, so the lecture that I was preparing to for you today, and I, ho I will not stick to all of what we you will see on screen. Uh, also, you know, in order not to uh, tire you too much, because I mean it's all already late, not only for me. <laughs> so the title of my um, uh, you see already here is a plural in the title Arab histories. It's not just one history, because I think. It's very difficult, not not only for the Arab world, but in general, you know, if we speak about history, it's like, again, too, we look too much to the center and we forget about that there is a huge diversity also in terms of power relations between in history. So there is al always also the history on the top and on the bottom and it's a, a lot of in between. Um, okay, so and what I wanted to uh, kind of touch upon uh, today is uh, looking at Arab film histories between the national and the transnational and between art and triviality, which means actually between different dichotomies, between binarisms, uh, because um, a lot of what has been said and also uh, how we perceive 
Arab cinema is also about, you know, sort of differences, uh, geographic, but also in terms of ideology. Uh, so one of the first dichotomies that actually uh, shape, and actually, I mean, these are real dichotomies that shaped uh, the history of Arab cinema is in a way also the, the geographic one. Um, between Mashrek and Maghreb. I'm not, I'm not sure that all of you are familiar with the terms. Maghreb, that's the Arab term for the, the East, and Mashrek is the Arab term for the West. And um, it's used, you know, to describe uh, um, more or less the difference between North Africa and uh, the Middle East. Uh, the a frontier goes somehow in bet between Libya, and actually, it's it's not it's a, a slightly also a cultural uh, uh, a culture a sort of cultural um, frontier because you know f in North Africa there is a strong I mean influence of uh, uh, the Amazir so called Amazir or what we sometimes also call the call the Berber. Uh, culture, and this has has had also a deep influence on on language. Uh, so the Eastern and Western uh, Arab dialects are quite different. And so, when Egyptian film industry uh, began in the 1920s, um, it could impose its own uh, its own dialect, which is very different from the dialects of the Maghreb uh, on actually the viewers also of the Maghreb uh, for the reason that uh, Egyptian e Egyptians were had also they were a very you know um, um, it was a very active cultural center Egypt at the time and it attracted also artists particularly from Syria and and from Lebanon and um, uh, the song the Egyptian song was at that time already, you know, was you know available on on discs and was distributed all over the Arab world, and so this was the 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 the, the precursor of cinema and was the reason why Egyptians could then later on, um, uh, when they were able to make films, to um, uh, to also uh, um, make their films available on the linguistic level. That means people had already tuned in themselves to the Egyptian song and were trying to understand it. And this is why they were able also to apprehend and comprehend Egyptian films. And of course, one of the reasons why uh, um, the Maghreb itself did not really create a cinema for its own, and of, the, of course there was colonial cinema during the time, but because French colonialism was also particularly strong, uh, unlike the British colonialism, in, in terms of imposing a sort of cultural dominance on, uh, on, on, the, on the region in which it was colonizing. Um, so, um, the first dichotomy is Maghreb Mashrek in the term, uh, in the sense that Egypt became the first film industrial center, the so-called Hollywood of the Nile, uh, in the in which started in the late 19, uh, 1920s, while the production in all the other ca Arab countries started much later, only after uh, independence, uh, uh, national independence. So. Um, and this ha has, has several reasons. One of them is, as I said, colonialism, um, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, population. You know, if you make films, you need to recuperate. And um, also a development, because I Egypt had already a quite a strong in, uh, uh, stronger economy and a larger population than all the rest of the countries. This was the major reason. Okay, so in terms of history, now it's also a sort of division we have you know the first the colonial phase where we have only colonial cinema in the Maghreb and we have attempts in other Arab countries but largely it is Egypt that has been producing the, the and with you know in the 30s it has already uh, f uh, several um, studios and uh, was uh, you know producing uh, a number of until the 50s there were hundreds of films already that had been also started to be um, exported. Um, 
whereas all the other, not all the other Arab countries, a certain number of Arab countries, because there are some countries and up to date, like Sudan and Mauritania, who has al almost no, no cinema. Uh, I mean, um, uh, so it was Syria, Iraq, Tunisia, Algeria, where the state, uh, after independence, actually created um, film organizations, and they were m more or less responsible for the production over there. Um, then in Morocco and Lebanon, uh, who had no socialist um, um, endeavor, uh, both of them had private, uh, private, uh, private film production. But in Morocco, it was very weak. While in Lebanon, it was actually it stood in the shadow of Egypt. So uh, you know, um, uh, they Egypt, uh, Lon uh, Lebanon would would export um, uh, their singers and actors to Egypt, and uh, some of their money actually also. So there was a close correlation in terms of distribution and production between Lebanon, partly also Jordan and Egypt. Um, okay, uh, now, and but in the 1990s with the decline of the bureaucracy, uh, with the decline of the socialist idea and the decline of you know, the first nationalism, nas nationalist waves in, in, in the Arab countries, also the, the uh, public sector project declined so that cinema uh, in these countries had to look for, you know, uh, to look for funding elsewhere. That means they, uh, filmmakers, uh, from particularly from the Maghreb region, not from Egypt, but also from Lebanon and um, and Syria, were trying then to to look for funding from Europe. And this was the almost the only option how they could make films. Um, so this was the. Yeah, the period following also actually also Camp David, uh, the Camp David Agreement in, in 76. Um, and it was also the, the, the phase where, um, where the Gulf region started to come up as, a, as, you know, to make history in the sense, not only because of the oil, uh, but also, you know, because of suddenly there were consumers, new consumers there. And uh, this caused also a shift uh, within Egyptian film industry, who catered before for you know those countries who had uh, movie theaters, but the Gulf did not have most of the countries in the Gulf did not have movie theaters. But then it was actually the electronic media, the introduction of the video and television that um, helped to spread Egyptian cinema um, in the Gulf region. And step by step, actually, they were, in a sense, also able to dominate parts of the production in Egypt uh, as, you know, not in terms of, um, um, in, in terms of, of a direct influence, but an indirectly by um, uh, this by their distribution companies in Ku in Kuwait largely, and uh, by the consumer interests there, which was much more conservative actually also, and so this was a kind of real um, an, 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 a, a, a strong strong change in in the history of Egyptian cinema. Uh, um, okay. Now, after the millennium, we have uh, the current phase, um, which is uh, uh, shaped by not only a stronger presence of the Gulf states, now not only as consumers, but more, more and more also as producers and as hubs for cultural uh, events. Um, but we have also smaller countries who started to produce their films, like Jordan. Uh, um, and particularly Jordan, actually, Bahrain to a certain extent, and, and Kuwait. Um, Bahrain, which is not a, a very um, uh, affluent country, unlike other, and Saudi Arabia, but, you know, we can speak about that later. Um, okay. So, one of the, one of, now I was speaking about I, I tried to give you a very quick and brief survey on Arab film histories, uh, which means the different countries, uh, what happened to, uh, there. And 
Now, the, one of the dichotomy I was talking about, about uh, Mashrik and Maghreb, was sort of, is also, there, is, there are others, other dichotomies, like the dichotomy between mainstream and art film. Because when the first, um, when the public sector um, uh, project started, it was at the moment of decolonization. So the interest of Arab states like Syria, or let's rather say the, the, the cultural elite also, who partly forced their, their uh, governments to create these public sectors, uh, like in Tunisia, um, Algeria, and, and, and Syria, they were, it was also, you know, the artists, they wanted to have this intervention of the state in order to, it was a protectionist idea actually, in order to create a, diff a, a cinema that is different, that is, uh, is um, not film industrial, that is not mainstream, but that uh, speaks about the people, that reflects the image of the people. Um, and so, of course, some of you, I mean, the, will immediately remember the idea of, you know, first, third, uh, second and third cinema. Uh, these were, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary, uh, or these ideas or the concepts of the first, second and third cinema were linked to uh, um, Latin American uh, thinkers um, um, where, who created this idea that, you know, um, this, that uh, first cinema is Hollywood cinema, that is, uh, uh, which is a sort of dream factory that uh, cheats people. Um, and while the second, second cinema, these are all the film industries of the third world, like Indian film industry or Egyptian, Iranian, Mexican, etc., who are trying to copy that was the idea of, you know, uh, that was the sort of revolutionary idea, who copy uh, Hollywood cinema and also, you know, function in as, as dream factories for their people and do not help them, you know, to reflect their, about their own image or, you know, to also to, refer, to, to give another image of, the, of, of the, the formerly colonized people and to help in, with decolonization. But then there was another step, I mean, in the 80s when the public project collapsed and filmmakers turned to the West uh, to look for money, there was this idea of the cinema d'auteur, cinema of the author, which is a more individualist concept, but still, again, it is set up against the mainstream cinema. So what I want to say here, there are, again, here we have you know, mainstream and the other sort of cinema. And Egypt, as the main film industry in the region, <coughs> became, <coughs> on an ideological level, became to equivalent almost to the dream factory, the mainstream, the commercial. That what people, uh, what other Arab countries and filmmakers from the rest of the Arab world wanted actually to get rid of. So <clears throat> now let me show you um, a very brief, uh, uh, of like five minutes, from a film by um, Farid Boridir, uh, a Tunisian filmmaker who is very known for his film Halfawin, of course. It was one of the fi first art house <laughs> films uh, from the Arab world to be distributed in the West was distributed in, on the art house level uh, in, if I remember correctly, in 1992. Uh, so, Farid Bouridir, but Farid Bouridir was a child of the cine club uh, movement in, in, at home. Um, and <clears throat> so he belonged to a group also of people who created the Cartage Film Festival in 1966, which was also meant as, you know, as a, as a, as a counter project to, uh, it was an Africa, as a, the African and uh, Arab film festival that was meant, you know, to counter this kind of colonialist project and to represent, you know, cinemas from the south. Um, now, in, in 1982, uh, <coughs> Farid Boridir 
shot a documentary which is called Kamara Arab, and I'm, I'm going to show you a few minutes so you can see for yourself what he thinks about cinema. <clears throat> okay, now I hope that I can get right to the, to the film. Let's hope, yeah, looks good for the first, does it look good? Uh, it, play, starts play, yeah, yeah, play. it starts uh, sleeping after a while, I have to get <laughs> the feeling program sleeps. <laughs> commencement du monde était le chant et la danse. Pendant plus de 40 ans, pour le public du monde arabe, le cinéma se résumait à un seul pays, l'Égypte. Partie des studios du Caire, ses mélodrames et ses comédies musicales surtransportaient les spectateurs arabes sur le tapis volant du rêve. Après okay, l'arrivée au pouvoir de Nasser musical, en 1952, plusieurs cinéastes de talent ont émergé au sein de l'industrie égyptienne et proposeront un cinéma réaliste plus attentif now, aux transformations new... sociales de l'Égypte. Parmi eux, an, trois précurseurs. A new, um, Taufir Sala, wave of qui partira en exil pour réaliser appeared. son film Les Dupes, consacré à la tragédie palestinienne. Shadi Abdesalam, qui disparaîtra en 1986, après avoir signé un seul long métrage en 1970, l'admirable La Momie, riche d'une esthétique nouvelle, inspirée de l'héritage pharaonique. Inspired Et by the Youssef Shahin, uh, le novateur, l'inclassable, qui, dès 1958, ose affronter les tabous de sa société dans son chef dœuvre Babel Hadid, qui écrit, réalise et interprète lui-même. La France, la the third le world, that's for me, America, me, England. I'm here since 7,000 years. À la suite de la révolution de Nasser, les indépendances de la Tunisie, du Maroc, puis de l'Algérie vont ajouter le Maghreb à la liste des territoires arabes libérés et favoriser so la naissance d'un nouveau cinéma uh, totalement all différent the du the countries of North Africa saw, uh, dans la this foi was et la ferveur qui accompagnent ces indépendances et les espoirs fous qu'elles apportent. Les cinéastes du Maghreb vont tâcher par leur cinéma de vibrer au diapason de cette liberté chèrement acquise mm. en célébrant la lutte passée and, uh, and et en chantant la dignité retrouvée des humains. Filmmakers from the Maghreb um, used this time for, uh, you know, to realize their dreams of freedom. de l'Algérien Lakhdar Amina, qui remportera le prix de la première œuvre Al au 21e festival uh, Lakhdar Amina, who got the first prize Palme d'Or in, in, in Cannes for his film. Après lui, 
de nombreux cinéastes vont surgir de partout, au Maghreb puis au Proche-Orient, et s'emparent enfin de cette caméra Contrairement au vieux cinéma égyptien, dans ce nouveau cinéma arabe, This les films new... commerciaux ou de propagande deviennent une minorité qui cède le pas au cinéma d'auteur. Okay, qu'ils soient this... financés par leurs états ou qu'ils additionnent quelques bouts de ficelle pour assurer leur tournage de façon artisanale, ces okay. cinéastes indépendants se posent en véritable franc-tireur de l'image. Ils luttent pour exprimer passionnément leur pays dans le cinéma et rêvent déjà uh, une alliance future entre were, uh... les pays de la région who are fighting for their own vision uh, with a sort of new uh, artistic cinema uh, in order also to express uh, better the Arab civilization. À la suite de Franz Fanon et des chantres de la décolonisation, les cinéastes se prennent à espérer que ce tiers monde enfin libéré va contribuer à engendrer un homme nouveau. Following the Plus ideas by Franz Fanon, these filmmakers were uh, hoping to, uh, to uh, contribute to decolonization. De Mais en juin 1967, déjà, le nationalisme triomphant. Um, okay, so what is quite evident here um, at the as you can see, is already that also the film works out exactly the same uh, dichotomy that I was already pointing out uh, for you. This is actually the moment, uh, if you want, of creation uh, of creation of this sort of idea. Um, so, um, in the following, um, I would like to try and understand uh, where this comes from and what what kind of effect also in, in ter on the ideological level this had um, for, um, for also cinema studies, if we want to... Uh, uh, okay, let me just try to find... Pop, 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 where is it? Here. Yeah. No, <laughs> it was not the one I wanted. Um, okay, so we are speaking here about a concept of uh, center and periphery in the sense that Egyptian film industry has become a sort of center while the rest was perceived as a periphery. Um, it is a local center, but it is, uh, it is still... Um, that was, you know, the discourse that was de developed uh, at the time. Of course, we, we still need to ask if this was true. But um, I would like to cite here uh, the ideas of Stephen Croft, who um, uh, speaks about, you know, uh, the concept of national cinemas and how they developed. Uh, and to him, uh, the idea of Hollywood is that the interesting thing about uh, Hollywood is that even though it is a national cinema, it's a purely national cinema. I mean, the American films that we watch, they, you know, they deal with American, you know, feelings, American geography, Amer but we all consume them. And they become synonymous to international cinema. And this is a sort of power, um, uh, if you want to, a, dynam a, a dynamic that is... Uh, related to the creation of a, hegemo a, hegemon a hegemony, it is a power and it creates a power relation. So this idea that a national cinema becomes um, synonymous with uh, international cinema while r other national cinemas on the peripheries still remain national or even, you know, uh, I, as for example yesterday I heard a, a, a British... Um, commissioning editors speaking about still today speaking about indigenous cinemas so uh, you know the idea that you know you can't you, the the i mean films from from other regions like from africa for example in this in this concept don't even deserve the name of nation that you know they are still be beyond that of course we we have to discuss the the idea of the nation if this is appropriate i mean in terms because nation is another concept that kind of suffocates the, um, suffocates uh, cinema, but at the same time, it's interesting to look at that uh, concept. So is Egypt really 
uh, in that sense, um, also, does it, you know, become the sort of international of the Arab, uh, the international cinema of the Arab world? Um, and the reaction of Farid Bouridir and others, and also, you know, their uh, strong fight actually against Egyptian cinema, um, fight, which is a fight also of their own spectatorships, of course, is, um, is actually linked at times not only uh, to arts and the concept of arts, but unfortunately, it was also linked to a sort of, of, of local nationalism. Uh, and at the same time, the, the dismissal, uh, dismissing of Egyptian cinema as pure mainstream um, was also um, a, a kind of concept, oh, sorry, was, was a kind of concept uh, that actually I would, would rather see in, uh, as a sort of, of, of power struggle regionally in terms of how to, um, who, is, um, who gets more spectators, who can impose himself. himself. Um, some uh, European, um, uh, some European um, critics like, for example, Cluny, Jean-Michel Cluny, who created the first uh, dictionary for, of Arab cinemas, actually was also fostering this idea that Egy Egyptian cinema is purely a film industry, a, a, a dream factory, and, uh, and um, included in his dictionary, dictionary largely uh, also, you know, uh, also, also auteur films. So there was this fight also for auteur cinema, which is linked, and here I come with, a, with another concept, is linked with the idea of high uh, bro and low bro um, uh, art, where, where the concept of um, European art is a concept that is the dominant one. Art house cinema is more valuable than popular culture. This is the concept what, what is behind this. So the, the auteur films which became, which got to be produced in the 80s and 90s uh, because they were able you know, to get funding from abroad and of course that meant that they had to be different than the popular films of, of Egypt. Um, these films represented the more valuable, the more cultural, cultured films than the, the, the popular films that were produced in Egypt. And so there was, as you can see, there is a, a kind of, again, a fight for what is more important and who gets more access to what. Because the festival circuit to which Egyptian films, particularly of popular nature, never made it, the international festival circuit. And so if you don't get access to the international festival circuit, you are excluded. And so normally, and we can see that also in the case of the Bollywood, Bollywood uh, cinema, that Bollywood films made it only recently actually to a sort of, you know, they came to fame in, in the West. Uh, there are only since like maybe eight, nine years, um, private channels in Germany, for example, who, who, who screen uh, who broadcast Bollywood films because it has become on vogue. But I would argue this has happened only at a moment when India became, became an important player in, wor in world, um, um, on the level of world economy. And so as long as you, you, know, you produce a popular culture, you remain really second rate. So the idea of second world was actually not that not that inaccurate. So Egyptian film industry uh, had a regional importance for regional audiences, but w you could never see these films in, in European festivals, unlike the auteur films, uh, who were, you know, accessible, far, uh, much more accessible. So, and until today, you will find that the, the, the problem. If you want to look for an Egyptian movie from the 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, you will find it on YouTube, but it's never translated. You can find almost every film you want, but you will not find a, a, a translation for it because it's for Arab audiences and not. Okay. Um, all right, um, now 
today, actually, we can say there is a multiplication of centers and peripheries. With the advent of the Gulf states, we have a new era, actually, because the film hubs that they are creating and the new production centers, and they have also created within the last year's uh, funds. Um, so many Arab filmmakers now have, you know, turned from the West a bit more to the Gulf for production, to look for production and also for kind of for festival um, uh, uh, distribution. And in a way, again here, you know, the, the balance shifts a bit. We have still Egypt producing, but far less than it produced before. Egypt produced, for example, in the 80s, uh, it, sometimes up to 100 films, 90 films a year. Today, it's sometimes only 20, 30, the utmost. We have Morocco that is also producing almost 20 uh, films because it has a had a very wise and, and w good funding policy. But unlike Egypt, it has no local audiences. They have only 30 cinemas, while in Egypt, the multiplex cinemas are booming, and there is also television, etc. So. <coughs> Making films does not mean you know you are also have you you are able to distribute them. All right. So I actually wanted to give you a, a, a more detailed uh, insight into Egyptian cinema, but I think you know um, it it doesn't. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. Uh, what what you maybe just need to know uh, for about Egyptian cinema as a national cinema is that actually also its its development was very much linked to uh, to local f to local money that means you know the 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 input of the stu uh, studio uh, um, of Misra Bank and Talat Harb was very important there were local businessmen who were trying you know to put a lot of money in that new industry and they actually succeeded also in doing that and in the 50s it was one of the major uh, industrial uh, sectors in in the country uh, and it deteriorated only uh, uh, during the Nasserist era with uh, with the public sector because a lot of cinemas was na were nationalized, etc. Um, okay. Um, well, and up to date, actually, this was one of the, one of the first fi films in, uh, made in Egypt, but it was quite Orientalist, as you can see. With a Bedouin, these were sort of Bedouin films shaped a little bit after some of the, you know, Son of the Sheikh, etc. Um, what is important still to say about Egyptian cine cinema was the linguistic difference uh, that I pointed out before, East and West. Until today, for Egyptian cinema, uh, for Egypt's media industry, the uh, the asset, the real asset, is the linguistic asset, uh, because the audiences in the uh, other parts of the Arab world have learned to listen to it, particularly, particularly. Uh, an analphabet, illiterate people. They are not, you know, they, they do not watch, an, uh, they cannot watch an American film because they cannot read the subtitles, but they can watch an Egyptian movie because since childhood they have learned to understand. Uh, and this is still um, uh, the, the advantage of, you know, that, that uh, how, how Egyptian cinema can still stel, sell and also how they still, uh, still can sell their. Uh, uh, also other media products like series, for example, film series uh, for television. Okay, now here the movie theaters, the development from the 1930s, you can see here in the in the very small, uh, on that side, you know, benches, this were the third, third class cinemas, terzo, the so-called terzo, and, um, and uh, some posters from the 80s. Just, I want to introduce to you a little bit the uh, popular uh, cinema, because it's very dear actually to the people of the Arab world. Uh, while the auteur cinema has never managed to create large, uh, a large spectatorship. Um, and so it's still diff problematic. I mean, what I want to point out here is the way how um, Egyptian cinema has been marginalized during the 60s, 70s also as, you know, even as a topic of study, uh, of research, was problematic. Uh, because in my view, popular cinema can still, uh, is not just, you know, uh, I mean the concept of um, the dream factory is 
a concept that does not really i mean it's a, a good it's an ideological concept but it's not a good concept for studies because in, and i had the the quotation of stuart hall before is that uh, you know popular culture is a, an arena where actually we can see uh, the power struggle social and po po political power struggles going on and usually uh, uh, according to my view and the way how I analyze these films is that you can discover that in many popular films, melodramas or whatever, actually the, 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 uh, the, the social struggle is inscribed in it in, in different voices, in negotiations, in constant negotiations. So it's not simply, you know, um, a, a cinema that is that deprives people of for example, one of the most important examples is melodrama. Melodrama uh, was, you know, seen as, you know, with belly dancers and da 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 and so on. But it was always melodramas always were dealing with, uh, you know, with love, which was a new concept for Arab society, and so love was always favored. Uh, uh, you know, the love marriage. Of uh, and what also was important was the, for melodrama. Uh, no melodrama functions without in 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 Egypt for, without the gap between rich and poor. So and it was an it had an empowering element. So if you you know you you there were love marriages between or love um, uh, love affairs between poor people and rich people. And when they made it in the end to the happy end, and the rich guy would marry. The, the the poor girl or vice versa, then you know this was a success. It was a an empowerment actually for the an emotional empowerment. So that means these these aspects were disregarded uh, earlier. Okay, uh, so uh, now the realist cinema was uh, you know a sort of cinema that was created against melodrama, against musical drama, and it was also valued more as the the cinema that represents the, the post-colonial phase. And now, and Egyptian cinema was then denounced also as the royalist cinema. Uh, and this is one of the melodramas that you can see because, because rich people, nice, nice, uh, nice uh, <laughs> designs and settings. Yes. Okay. So um, I'll skip that with the with the in the, with uh, the public sector. Uh, and I talked to you already about the development of non-Egyptian cinema. Um, uh, the development of the of of the Arab countries today is a bit, uh, you know, there is a big gap actually between the, the different Arab countries because Morocco is actually one of the most successful in fostering a national cinema, while uh, some of the countries like Algeria, who had a very strong public sector, al almost has you know deteriorated. The 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 production has almost become nil, particularly because of the civil war. And Lebanon was also, even though they had a big production, big production centers, also popular ones in the 50s, 60s, the, the, it was completely destroyed in the civil war. But now Lebanon is taking over again. Uh, it, it has become a center for, uh, for production again. Uh, and even you know for exporting films, which is something quite new. A film, some of you might know the film Caramel. And so this was, uh, you know, like the, the appearance of the new um, commercial mainstream Lebanese cinema and its, its uh, attempt also to um, create uh, stars, etc. And we will come back to that in, uh, at the very last uh, end of the lecture. Okay, uh, so we see after the, 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 the deterioration of, an, of the public sector, um, the different Arab countries took took different directions. And of course, Iraq, where the private sector of the beginning was hijacked by the state, it was forbidden to produce private films. But then, you know, after the invasion of, uh, of uh, and the war there, uh, there is today literally no cinema. It's very hard to make films. You know, you have one, two th films. And even on the ground, it's very difficult to shoot. Um, all right. So we, we talked already about the advent of the electronic media in the 1970s um, and also in Egypt to create the attempt to create a cinema d'auteur but which was not so successful because the industry was always very strong 
uh, Yusuf Shaheen, the one you saw in the film, uh, was one of the few who actually <coughs> managed to make auteur films. He started with an auto autobiographic film, Alexandria Y, and was kind of initiating moment to other Arab filmmakers uh, from Tunisia and, uh, and Syria, etc., to make autobiographic films. Uh, but he did so because of he, you know, he was able to also get funds from France, particularly, and uh, also because his family was kind of affluent, so they could uh, produce on their own. Now, in the 1990s, um, there is a, um, a shift. Uh, it's not only the digital turn; it's a satellite era also, where. Um, 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 Spectatorships also changes in a way. Uh, um, I mean, private television, cable television, etc., comes, but the digital turn is much more. For Egyptian cinema, okay, uh, there is also the shop shopping mall era, which is in a way also linked to the new technologies of multiplex cinemas. Um, here you have an um, aspect. And multiplex cinemas are not working everywhere in the in the Arab world, but only in in certain countries. In Morocco, they are for example, completely absent. Uh, they work well, quite well in, in uh, of course, in the Gulf. Um, so uh, this is, there is a sort of very strong um, di difference between different between the Arab countries in, in terms of infrastructure and also of, of audiences' interests. Okay, now the star, star system and film distribution uh, is very important because Egypt's uh, film industry doesn't function without the stars. And it was, uh, apart from the language, it's also the stars who are responsible for, the, for its success elsewhere. Uh, so, and uh, actually the, the, the distribution formula, I mean the money when it come, came from the Gulf, particularly during the 90s and still does to a certain extent, then it would be all, always, you know, the pre-sales go for the name of the star. And this is a very um, stifling moment, actually, for, uh, for uh, filmmakers, because they have really to, sub sub to completely to succumb to the, to the rules of the, of the popular, of the, of the mainstream. Um, okay. Now, the dig digital turn is in, in, in so far important because in a way it's also a link now to the, to, to the present and to also to the Arab rebellion in a, in, a, in a, and of course you are certainly very interested to know more about the Arab rebellion in that sense. But the digital turn is not only the advent of satellite television and new media uh, like the internet that opened up different, different venues for uh, distribution. Uh, but it's al also <clears throat> it gave an a sort of independence to new f to young filmmakers, because it made it incredibly cheap to produce films. Uh, so now you know you 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 can young people they can have if they have a laptop and a small camera they can make a film. Of course, it's not the, the cinema. It's not it's not a movie theater film, but it's still. You c it's it's something that it empowers you to do something, and it's no no accident that exactly in the 1990s it was also that the art, the art scene, uh, in in the Arab world uh, liberated itself also from from the hegemony of the state. So we know of you know like um, experimental <coughs> films that were made like by Hassan Khan and others um, in Lebanon was of, of course the, avant the real avant-garde in the early 1990s already. And uh, so there is a kind of cross-fertilization between the arts who used, the, were the first to use now the new digital media in order to play also more with, uh, you know, to experiment more with the audiovisual media and then new, young filmmakers who started using now the new digital technology in a more professional way, but still that is cheaper. Um, uh, so um, Yusuke Naskalla was in 1990 uh, the first one to use a digital camera for a, a movie uh, 
that was later released also in cinema. Hamad Khan did this with, an, with his own production while uh, Yusri Naskallah got money from abroad. Uh, Muhammad Khan um, produced this film on his own with very little means. And then we have now the advent of a completely new um, generation like Ibrahim Batut in 2008 with In the Eye of the Sun, which was a collective work. Uh, these people, uh, Ahmad Abdullah and Ibrahim Batut, Ahmad Abdullah with microphone, and then we have the co collectives that started appearing in, two, actually Hassala collective started in 2010, before the revolution. Um, so there was a new spirit there, using the new technology, cheaper technology, but also combine it with collective work, with um, uh, young filmmakers who uh, collect their friends, they make a workshop and they try to pull to together a film. And Microphone is such a film. The, even the stories were written together, you know, people wrote them. Uh, Ayn Shams was also uh, spontaneously uh, developed also with, with amateurs. Um, the collectives also, Hassala Collective is now becoming more and more important. It was, uh, you know, first it, w it was created because Hala Lotfi in 2009 started producing her, her film Coming Forth by Day, which came only out in 2013. But then the, the young people around her, she, they helped her and then everybody helped you know, each, they helped each other. So now, up to now, they, they I think they produced now like two or three films, one, two, two documentaries are, were already in competition. Now one of them was here in competition in Qatar and in Abu Dhabi. So, you know, there is a lot of stuff going on. And of course, this was also at the moment of the revolution where this collective work was also kind of framed and started to develop in a different manner. And of course, it's not only Egypt, but I'm pointing out now, now uh, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian example. And interestingly, these kind of collectives, they are also in Syria. The Abu Naddara collective was also detrimentally important in, 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 in disseminating a work through the internet uh, and also on the, you know, becoming a mouthpiece, but also a sort of new art. Uh, yeah. There, were, there was suddenly a new arena, you know, and now, uh, for example, in 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 the in some of the parts of Syria today, a few a few um, days ago, they had a, 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 hand, a, a portable phone um, festival, where, yeah, in 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 the parts where you know neither the <laughs> where neither the IS 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 governing nor, uh, or is is reigning nor uh, where where the uh, nor where the where the government is. So uh, the free Syrian army in that part, we have um, films and they screened also silvered water, um, Usama Muhammad's uh, self portrait. Uh, that he created with a Kurdish girl that was uh, caught in Homs in, 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 in the siege. And uh, the film is an experimental film around, you, you know, uh, on the dialogue of Osama Muhammad with the idea of cinema as such, but also with this besieged girl. And they were using all the, 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 mat film mat the filmed material uh, on the atrocities that were committed uh, in Syria like uh, torture and, and killings and so on. They used that also in order to, to create a sort of, of, of history of his country. So now as you see, Syri Syria, the, the, almost the infrastructure of, of cinema has been almost destroyed, even though of course the film organization is still there in, in Damascus. But of course the Syrian cinema of before, during the dictatorship, which was a very artsy, almost incomprehensible uh, comprehensible cinema for reasons that I could also explain that are related to the dictatorship, of course. But now, you know, the, 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 the filmmaking has, you know, it cannot be the same as before. It has become, you know, went into a completely different directions. And the new filmmakers that appear now uh, are, um, you know, like, for example, the film The Immortal Surgeon that was shot during the shooting of Muhammad Mullah's film 
who made artsy an artsy film in 2000 who really managed to make an uh, the letter to, the, to Damascus a completely artsy and and detached film made in 2012 uh, you know, and you could see the helicopters kind of flying by and so on. And this, his assistant made this film, Immortal Surgeon, about the shooting of the film and about actually the craziness that is going on around it. Uh, and so you can, if you watch these two films, it's like, uh, you know, watching a new era and a dead era. Um, would be also interesting to screen the two together to see, you know. <laughs> okay, so I want to show you now. Um, maybe you know, I know it's 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 too much, and so I I would actually like to close with two, um, just with a, with 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 two um, uh, um, trailers. But just to show you here the uh, here um, a, an image of Halfawin that was the first film that was. Tunisian film that was distributed as an art house film in Europe. Now they also developed the, the development for the art house cinema. Now Caramel in 2006, a sort of new mainstream uh, Lebanese uh, cinema. And here we have Nadine Lab Labaki, who is, uh, you know, she was a video art, uh, video um, uh, um, a di a director of video clips. And uh, a very beautiful woman and a sort of new star now. And you can see her now in Rock the Casbah, which is an international production uh, by Pate. <laughs> and, um, and you can see her star here. And this is now like a new era also, as I see it for Arab cinema. You have a few films that not only, it's not now art house cinema that that gets distributed, but this is a sort of really mainstream cinema fabricated for interna an international audience with Arab stars. Hiyam Abbas, Nadine Labaki, and Isabel, um, I forgot her name, a beautiful uh, uh, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan actor, who, actress who is also quite known in France. So here, you know, star, stars and um, the concept of mainstream cinema traveling, while, you know, Saudi Arabia made uh, its first appearance. Well, actually, the first Saudi Arabian film was uh, made in back in 2006, but this was the first internationally received. Okay, so we have new developments on on that field. But now, let me show you two trailers. I would like to show you the trailer of the Rock the Casbah and uh, Silver Water as um, kind of looking at. What's happening out there? Ma sœur, personne ne pouvait prévoir qu'il allait mourir. Elle est vivante avec nous. Papa était un homme exceptionnel. Il s'est fait tout seul. Il n'a jamais rien demandé à personne. Il a toujours aidé tout le monde dans cette famille. Mais elle est avec lui, mais elle a Oh non, mamie. Tu m'as manqué, ma chérie. T'es devenue une grande star. Arrête. Ça va avec les rôles qu'elle décroche que des terroristes. Des terroristes, mais à Hollywood. Très convaincante en terroriste d'Al-Qaïda. Tu as pas du mat, toi aussi. Alors c'est quoi ces cicatrices Elle s'est fait opérer les seins. C'est sa révolution à elle. J'ai pas besoin de mettre un piercing ici pour mon chien Martin. C'est un piercing, Nana, c'est la mode. On dirait une fille. Il faut que tu changes un petit peu de, de look. Et Jason, quand est-ce qu'il arrive On va se séparer. Chez nous, on ne divorce pas. Il est riche, il est célèbre. Qu'est-ce que tu veux de plus Je sais pas, va te remplir la tête, lit, voyage. Je peux pas lire. Je suis allergique au papier. <rire> Toi, il a fallu qu'il meure pour que tu aies le courage de revenir. Mais au moins, moi, j'ai choisi ma vie. Tu es pas devenu prof pour faire plaisir à papa. Repars à New York faire ton cinéma à la con. Ton père a laissé une belle merde derrière lui. Donc maintenant, c'est moi qui décide. Mais comment tu as pu te taire Oh Je vous emmerde Je vais boire une bière et vous oubliez tous il serait content de nous voir tout ensemble, de voir la maison pleine comme ça. Tu trouves que je l'ai coincé T'as un peu l'air d'une prof quand même. Il te fait jouir au moins, hein Quoi, il te fait jouir ou pas Ça fait scout. Un autre supermarché, je me suis fait même de la
So it reminds mm -hmm. us, of course, of all, you know, the, I mean, the no, films like the, these wedding films in the US. Uh, okay, this is a funeral, but, you know, the concept is known. Okay, the family gets together and then now we see the drama. And it's quite humorous and funny, actually. Uh, okay, and as you, you saw even with Omar Sharif as, uh, you know, a uh, very short appearance. Okay, now here we have the other side of, what's going on now, which I think would represent rather what's going on now in, as a, in sort of the, the alternative um, side of the digital era. Um, بدأت التحميل منذ ساعات. عشرين بالمئة كل ما قد تراه لم يعد هو سبعين بالمئة هلا هون بعد عند الناس يلا يلا سمي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يلا ما نضرب يا رب ما نضرب يلا هش 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رعب ما بعده رعب This was just a small, uh, you know, clip from uh, Silvered Waters by Osama Muhammad and um, a Kurdish, uh, th that Kurdish young woman that you saw. And the idea was that she was shooting and this, uh, the material was, you know, uh, the same time she, she said that it's going to get uploaded. So actually the film was made with all that uploaded material that was sent through the internet to Paris, while Osama Mohammed, who had uh, who stayed since 2011 in exile in, in, in Paris and was in communication with the Kurdish filmmaker, so she sent him all the materials through the internet all the time. Uh, and so there are some, I mean, mo very moving images, for example, of this little, little boy visiting the, the, the grave of his father, w which is heartbreaking, you know, while, while the little kid starts talking to his father, giving him flowers and speak while speaking to his father which is you know like and a lot of other stuff anyway so I want to close here and I, of course I cannot give you more than a, sh a sort of you know rough <laughs> survey on on different issues related to Arab cinemas uh, and of course I'm very happy to answer any questions <laughs> <laughs>